Hi, so light. Light is one of those funny things that we see every day, but we quite probably don't really understand very well. Now it's um, 100 BC before people started looking at this, and it was a guy called Empodocles who suggested that light actually came from you. It was a fire in your eye. It was a fire that Aphrodite lit and that shone out and that's how you could see things. It was a little inconvenient for him that somebody pointed out that you can't see in the dark. So he suggested it was an interaction between the fire in your eyes and the sun in the sky. And it wasn't until uh, 300 BC when Euclid wrote Optica that that view of light as being admitted by the seeing being was questionable. And in 55 BC, Lucretius, a Roman, took up that challenge and he suggested that light was a particle, a, a, an amount of matter that was shoved off from a light emitting body and it continued travelling in that direction once it was shoved away. And of course that idea is the idea that we think of as light as a particle. Now it's picked up again much, much later, in uh, 1592 actually, by Pierre Gassendi. Pierre Gassendi uh, lived from 1592 to 1655, and he's the guy that Newton read to help Newton form his ideas that appeared in the optics. So Newton's idea was light as a particle. And there were problems with it. I mean, it, it explained reflection really well, but it didn't explain refraction particularly well at all. Uh, Newton suggested that more dense fluids had a greater gravitational pull and would therefore slow down the light. But it was Hooke, Robert Hooke, who took up that story. Incidentally, Newton hated Hooke, did the best he could in his entire career to make sure that Hooke was never published and all his pictures were removed from the Royal Academy. But it was Hooke who took up the challenge and was looking at how coloured light was developed. That state of argument whether light was a wave or light was a particle began in 100 BC and ran right the way up until 1875 when Faraday noticed if you take a plain polarised light, so the light's only travelling in one direction, pass it through a dielectric and then hold a magnetic field next to it, it would bend. It would rotate its direction of polarisation. And of course, that suggested very heavily that light was electromagnetic in its properties. And it was James Clerk Maxwell who took that up and developed that into his equations. So, really, if people can argue about something, they will do. Since 100 BC, they've been arguing whether it is a wave or a light, and we now argue whether it's an electromagnetic wave or a particle. And that argument actually still goes on. In some senses, it seemed to be an electromagnetic wave. In some senses, it seemed to be in a particle. And in some senses, it seemed to be a mixture of both. So how you want to see light, pun not intended really, depends on, to a greater or less extent, to what you want to do with it. Now, in solar photovoltaics, we, it tends to be seen as a particle. Now, it was in 1839 when Becquerel first saw the photovoltaic effect, but it wasn't until the 1940s that the first photovoltaic cells came out, and because they weren't very good, it was in the 70s or so we started getting reasonable percentages out of silicon-based photovoltaics. Now, there's a problem with silicon. It's limited, uh, theoretically, at around about 22.7% efficiency. The highest efficiency has been 32.6%, but that was actually with the um, solar cell made from gallium arsenic and gallium stibnite, rather than anything like silicon, so its efficiency was much higher. Now, the way solar cells work, well, there are two layers of semiconducting material, an N-type layer and a P-type layer. They're doped silicon. Now, in the n-type layer, the doping gives you lots of free electrons which can move relatively easily because there's lots of excess electrons kicking around. In the p-type layer, however, it's doped differently. So there's a deficiency of electrons, and these are referred to as holes. And the electrons can move from hole to hole, and as movement is relative, what we say is that the holes can move. So we have freely moving electrons and freely moving holes. Now when we bring those two together, then electrons can move from where there's an excess of electrons to where there's a deficiency of electrons. And this creates a zone called the depletion zone, which has a charge top and bottom. Now when sunlight hits them, it knocks an electron out, and that electron's then attracted to the other side of the depletion zone, 
and so we get a current flowing. Now, of course, once that happens, then the electrons move from the other side and fill in the holes. Now, this is usually arranged monolithically, where we put in a lot of contact electrode, top and bottom, and of course that's going to be what collects the current, and we get generation. So looking at efficiency, looking at different materials, looking at improving that, is a huge amount of solar research. But of course there's the other way that we seem to have forgotten in solar research. Remember, it doesn't only have to be a particle, it can be a wave as well. And if we can look at collecting it in the same way that we collect other electromagnetic radiation, like radio waves, for example, then we can look at creating energy directly from the wavelength of light. Now, it is no doubt that the world is a marvellous and magical place. It does some of the most amazing things. Sometimes you don't know why they do them and they'll argue about it, but the fact is they do them. Now, if I take a piece of wire in a coil, attach it to a battery and a switch, and I open and close that switch, it'll set a magnetic field. And we can see that if we put a compass next to it, the compass will be deflected. The re even more curious thing is, if I replace that compass by another coil and do the same thing, that will set up a current in the other coil, which is of course exactly how radio waves work. Radio waves have a giant transmitter that sends out that signal as an electromagnetic wave, the receiver picks it up and it's able to translate that back into an electrical signal. So to do that and make it useful for us, we need two things. One is an antenna to pick those waves up, and two is a diode to rectify them into DC so we can use them. Now, the issue with an antenna is it's related to the wavelength size. And for television and radio, those wavelengths, well, they're huge. And for light, they're really tiny in the order of nanometers. So it represents two challenges. The diode must be able to cope with the speed at which it comes through because at a high frequency, coming very quickly in sort of the megahertz, terahertz kind of range. And the size of the wavelength, which is in nanometers, is incredibly small. So those two issues are the issues that have stopped us being able to directly use sunlight as we would do a radio wave. But of course, there have been advances. And the advances are in two fascinating fields. One's called metamaterials. Metamaterials are a juxtaposition of two materials together in a structured organisation that creates a material that does not exist in any other class and is able to perform that job of being a very small antenna. The other one, the one that's really held everything back, has been a diode that could operate quickly enough because silicon diodes just aren't up to the job. However, there is a class of diodes that is up to the job, and they're called metal insulator metal diodes, or MIM diodes. Now, we've made one of these in video 1494. When we looked at the partisan battery, we made a copper, copper oxide, copper MIM diode, and we were able to generate electricity through heat. Now, MIM diodes are being explored heavily for exactly that reason, and a new research has come out where they've been using gold, aluminium oxide and titanium to form a metal insulator metal diode and it turns out this particular combination is fast acting enough so that sunlight along with a metamaterial antenna can be directly converted in the same way as radio waves into electrical energy. Now it is just at the research phase but it's extremely exciting because it doesn't have the limitations on it that silicon does. Silicon remember is uh, theoretically only 22.7% efficient, so it's never going to get efficient enough, efficient enough. The MIM diode with the antenna, which is called a rectenna, incidentally, because it's an antenna and rectifier in one unit. So the rectenna research that's going on has the potential of reaching 100% efficiency, and that's got to be really exciting. So it's a huge move away from silicon um, solar cells to rectennis based solar cells. And the reason I personally find it exciting, well, a silicon solar cell or a solar cell with current methodologies looking at live, uh, light as a particle, unless you happen to have some industrial manufacturing, a, a lab or two, and some really expensive chemicals, are considered beyond the reach of the average person. 
but the Rectenor based solar cell I think is well within the reach of the average tinkerer. As I say, we've already made MIM diodes and we have made Rectenors using our ink before now. So this ability to make MIM diodes and Rectenors is something that can fall within the capability of the average adventurous experimenter. And that's what I find exciting. It means we can really seriously think about making solar cells that are good. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.